Welcome everyone. It is Sunday and we're getting on to uh, the number uh, of sessions uh, 18, our 18th session. And we discovered that we missed uh, the talk from January 2nd. 2nd. So we're going to start with that today, try to get as far as we can, and we're going to need to add one more session, which will be announced this afternoon uh, by email. So welcome, everyone. We're looking forward to this with you, as always. And Ward, it's all yours, my friend. OK, well, uh, this is January 2nd. Um, can you see it? Is it there? It's coming. There it is. Yep. OK, uh, so we're jumping back a few days. We skipped over this one by mistake. Remember that the day before this, January 1st, was when that amazing thing happened at Maribad with the whole school breaking out, weeping. And there was a lot of that still continuing through these uh, early days of January. Uh, so this is the whole scene. So now we're back to the, uh, let's see, January first, the one before that, had uh, been talking about uh, the different uh, layers of uh, Titania. We've covered all the skies, but are the different modes of thinking that you have at different levels of the path. So now Bob is going to go on with that. Okay, so here we are. Jim. All right. <clears throat> Yesterday, we discussed Antarjan, Guptajan, and Atmajan, associated respectively with the third, fourth, and fifth planes. Just a little now, bit slower, Jim, okay? Just a little slower. Yeah. I, I'm sorry? Just a little bit slower. Oh, slower, okay. Yeah, a bit. Now, we shall proceed further and move on to the sixth plane. The chap that we find here on the sixth plane actually sees God. As we observed yesterday, the one with Atma Jan on the fifth plane knows God. Such Jan or knowledge is not merely intellectual, but the real knowledge or Jan of God himself. Suppose a scorpion stings a man without his having seen it. Despite his not having witnessed the attack, the man comes to know of the poison when, it, when its effects are felt. And he realizes then that he has been stung by a scorpion. This kind of knowing can be compared with that of the fifth plane arf who knows God without seeing him. But the man on the sixth plane is like the one who actually sees the scorpion who has done the stinging. The fifth plane adept has the experience too, but he does not see the one who has produced it. Or for another analogy, Suppose that while traveling to Nagor, one smells the scent of ganja, <laughs> marijuana, wafting from one of the warehouses along the road. And from this aroma, he makes out that someone is smoking ganja in that vicinity. His knowledge is like that of the fifth plane. But when he actually sees the ganja warehouse, then his experience can be likened to that of the sixth plane. But the one who actually smokes the ganja himself has the true experience of it, like realization of God on the seventh plane. Okay. Is, is Baba promoting marijuana after all? <laughs> yes. So. I noticed you didn't have any trouble pronouncing that word, Jim. <laughs> We just remember back a few decades, and man. <laughs> the old boy. It was, oh. Should I continue? Please. Yeah. But as I told you yesterday, 
having attained to the fifth plane, one cannot fall from there back to ordinary human form gross consciousness. Leaving the body at death, one takes birth again, stationed on the fifth plane. From that point, he advances on to the sixth plane and thence on to the seventh. But never during this course of progress does he slip back down below the fifth to the fourth or third plane, etc. But the chap on the sixth plane, as we were explaining, goes beyond just having knowledge as on the fifth plane, but actually experiences sak sankar, immediate presence, and directly sees God. God to him is like the flame of the burning lamp which was just seen by you all. And yet this sixth plane fellow is still a prisoner of duality. That is the dichotomy of the seer and the seen. For he is the seer and God is the seen. At the same time, he sees all the spread of creation, the plains, skies, worlds, and so forth. But he sees God in all of these. I won't try that. Yaksha Ishwar ne bade joyche. He sees the immediate presence of Ishwar everywhere. The difference between the advanced saint of the sixth plane and the realized man of the seventh is that the former sees God everywhere while the latter sees self everywhere and in everything. And thus he has the actual experience. I am God. Aham Brahmash Brahmash Brahmasmi, Aham Brahmasmi. Aham Brahmasmi. I am the reality. Formerly he knew and had experienced of this great truth only indirectly through the medium of mere reading or hearing. But now he himself actually experiences it. The sixth sky is so near to the sixth plane that they are almost one. But here on the seventh plane, the distinction has vanished entirely. Since no station or village remains, on the seventh plane, there is only I, me. Yeah, and me that, is the Marathi first person pronoun. All right. This seventh plane, Maribad, is my place. Maribad, yeah, Majegar Ahe, Marathi again. He who sees me there will know me, but that cannot be accomplished without love. So create love. Okay. That's one now. We did we did all of this yesterday. Friday. Mm -hmm. Uh yeah, Friday, I mean to say. And uh we went through this one. Okay, so this one, uh, th uh this talk of six January um introduced these uh the principle that uh, the planes correspond to planes on the skeletal system, right? You guys remember that? Those of you who were here on Friday, the ankle, the knee, the hip, maybe. The text is very uh, corrupt, so a lot of the uh, uh, key words are missing, unfortunately. But the shoulder, the Adam's apple, the point between the eyes, and the crown of the head. So Baba was explaining all those correspondences. And he said, all of this is a lead up to an analogy that I'm going to be giving you at the end. 
So this next lecture is continuing on this same subject, but now he's going to talk about the correspondences of the asmans or skies to the skeleton, to the human body, the anatomy. So we're ready to start with this one, which is Saturday. Yeah. Melissa. Let me, let me just show the diagram again, just to, because I went over it kind of quickly there, but uh, you can see here the planes have been uh, correlated with parts of the body and like the third eye, sixth plane is here. But now this second person, um, here we're going to see correlations between the skies. So the first plane, the ankle is the point corresponding it to, but the first sky, that hollow in the sole of the foot is the corresponding spot. So that's what this diagram illustrate. And I did send out that diagram with the reminder. So if anybody didn't get it, just send us an email. And before yeah. We... Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Crypt Cabin, Saturday, 7th of January, 1928. Now, before we start in on the extended analogy that I have been promising you, first, let us ascertain what the skies or asmans associated with the various planes correspond to in the human body. The first sky or asman corresponds to the hollow in the sole of our feet. Always remember that the station and the sky are in a line, the first sky having its place underneath the ankle representing the first plane in a straight line down. The second sky or asman corresponds to the hollow immediately underneath the knee. Once again, exactly in a straight line. Maybe we should read this note because this is so uh, garbled, a lot of it. Hmm. It is unclear which part of the lower leg the word hollow refers to here, if the word knee designates the kneecap or the joint where the femur, tibia, and kneecap meet, perhaps the hollow is on the back side of the knee. This placement of the hollow does not accord with Baba's earlier stipulation, however, that the plane and the hollow stand in a ver vertical relationship, the one above the other. The third sky, or Asman, follows, and the note there says, Unfortunately, in both source texts, the lacuna here has not been filled in, and no sufficient editorial grounds warrant an editorial emendation. And then there's an, okay, the end note four on page 613 speculates that the body part associated with the third plane might be the hip joint. In that event, the associated hollow would be some body cavity below the hip. This is sheer speculation, however, until further evidence surfaces. The body parts associated with the third plane and sky remain a mystery. Ward's going to uh, commiserate with Elvis when we get to Memphis and see if he has any insights into that. Yeah, because he a, was a big hip guy. Yeah. So I'm going to channel and see whether, in his opinion, that's connected <laughs> with the third plane. Because of all his hip moves, he would know. Go ahead, Melissa. The third sky, or Asman, follows. Always remember that the first three skies are far removed from their respective planes. Thus, the hollow in the sole of the foot is at a distance below the ankle as is the hollow associated with and below the knee. The same is true of the body, of the body juncture corresponding to the third plane and the associated hollow. All of these are in a straight line with the plane above and the sky below at a distance from each other. Keep in mind also that these are the exact positions that I have been giving to you. And do remember when Baba was delivering this lecture, 
he was almost certainly pointing to parts of his own body. The fourth sky, or asman, is in a direct straight line with the armpit, or shoulder joint. The distance here is somewhat less than in the previous cases. The fifth sky, or asman, is even nearer still, that is, the hollow in the bones connected with the shoulder is in a direct line with the bones of the throat. And the note says, Presumably the hollow that Baba is referring to must be in the neighborhood of the top of the sternum, the top of the rib cage, and the collarbone. The throat bone must be the hyoid, located in the neck, slightly above the larynx. Alternately, it might designate the cartilage of the larynx itself. The sixth sky, or asman, is extremely close to the plane, as are the corresponding body parts. The forehead, representing the sky, and the point between the eyebrows, representing the plane. Remember, all these points of the body are exactly as I have indicated here. All of this has been given in the way of introduction. Now we come to the analogy itself. Picture a place. It has palace. a single, yes? Palace. Oh, I'm sorry. Picture a palace. It has a single door, but no windows. It stands on three pillars. It has seven walls, one of iron, another of zinc, a third of silver, a fourth of gold, a fifth of stone, a sixth of wood, and a seventh of pearls. In front of the palace extends a compound with three ponds, one filled with water, one with milk and one with rose water. Moving, moving out from the compound, there runs a lane. Seven tigers guard this lane. At the far end of the lane, there blooms a garden full of sweet smelling flowers. Surrounding each bunch of flowers, there is a mandap. A temporary structure such as that used in a wedding ceremony. Within each bunch of flowers is a snake. When you emerge from the garden, there opens before you a desert. After crossing the desert, you arrive at a river. On the far side of the river arises a great city. And with this, our analogy is finished. Okay, so this uh, figure, there was no figure in the original, but we thought it would be good to give a visual representation of what he's just described, right? So here's the palace. We had to do it as a little thing with seven uh, walls of the different stuff substances, as Baba described, standing on three pillars. Uh, the palace would be right there. And then you have the three ponds here filled with milk, water, and rose water. Uh, then here's the lane, and these are the seven tigers on the lane. Then here's the garden. These are all the mandaps. Um, and under them, there are these bunches of flowers with a snake in each bunch of flowers. Oops, sorry. Uh, now, uh, Going out from there, there's the desert, there's the river, and here's the great city. So that's the analogy he just gave. Maybe we could read this, uh, you could read this too, Melissa, the key. The vivid analogy or allegory with which Baba concluded this pair of lectures is represented in figure 38 in the form of a map in which the palace appears at the top and the city at the bottom. Three elements in the map, the palace, the tigers in the lane, 
and the flowers and a snake from the garden are visually expanded in the form of insert windows. The source manuscripts contain no illustration and give no indication that a diagram or drawing was intended. Figure 38 was conceived by the artist editor team entirely on the basis of Baba's verbal description within the lecture. With this introduction and extended analogy, the whole of Vedanta is intellectually opened up for the one who is made to understand it. This analogy has never been given before. Adding one last detail to the analogy, in that palace which I have referred to is seated a king. These things that I have told you have never before been revealed by or among the saints. Now they are being revealed to you since the time is fast approaching. Shri went on to give a pair of similes or comparisons. First, comparing the good luck of the boys with the fortunes of Chagdev, the great yogi of the fourth plane, who met up with his master, Dhyaneshwar, and was made perfect only after thousands of years. Yeah, maybe you could read this. Huh? I will. Hmm. Yes, I can. Baba's Tiffin Lecture of 7th July, 1926, characterized Changdev as a great yogi who dwelt in the samadhi of the fourth plane for 1400 years until he was pushed on by the grace of the Sadguru Dayaneshwar. See Tiffin Lectures. Stories of these two great saints and masters and their celebrated confrontation in the late 13th century were well established in the oral traditions and folklore of the Maharashtra and would have been well known to those of Baba's audience who did not hail from abroad. For brief, brief biographies, see Infinite Intelligence, pages 611, 612. This second simile concerned the eye, which, though so small in itself, can see objects thousands of times larger than the eye itself is. And this can happen because of the seer who is within it. And with this, the day's lecture was closed. <sighs> Thank you, Melissa. Okay, okay. So now we'll have, Di let's see, let me give you a hint here, Diana. Yeah. Okay, so these are the last, uh, we're coming down the runway to the last few lectures. And uh, these are all um, related to each other. So they're part of a three, of a series, you could say. Okay, Tuesday, 10th of January, 1928. Before finishing with this analogy and the topic it illuminates, today let us comment on energy and its seven divisions, since without this, our explanation will not have filled in its missing link. The matter of the seven forms, seven planes, seven skies, seven anons, and so forth, all having been attended to. Energy is connected with all of these groups of seven, except for the seven stations or planes, the seven states and the seven anons. As an approach to the understanding of energy, let us begin with movement. Movement has seven states. 
How so? Let us analyze movement by using the idea of a wave. A wave's seven states are these. Three states of rising, three of falling, and one in the momentary steady state. These seven can be seen only with the subtle eyes. And the footnote reads, strictly speaking, as Baba explains below, the seventh stage can be seen grossly, since in its seventh stage, the wave arrives at the gross sphere and acquires a bubble. We can discern that the movement of a wave occurs in seven states, but it transpires so quickly that it cannot even be seen with normal vision. Here, several analogies were given. One of these involved scented sticks of incense whose glowing lighted ends, if turned and whirled about the form of a circle so quickly that the individual gyrations can't be marked or counted out, convey the impression of stillness despite all these circling motions. Another such example is a, is a fast spinning top which, too, seems still and motionless as does a quickly revolving wheel. Shri continued, But remember, the wave itself is not itself a movement. The wave is the ocean when moving, and the movement has seven states. Why has a wave seven states? Because of the seven movements. So we have established this. The seven states in the wave are due to the seven states of energy which result from movement. Without movement, no wave arises. Wave means the ocean in movement. Now the first six states of this movement belong to the domain of the subtle, which means that they cannot be seen with the gross eyes. But in the seventh state, this movement acquires a bubble, which is to say a gross form which can indeed be seen with the gross eyes. Why is the bubble created? Because at the seventh stage, a clash occurs. The six movements occur without the arising of bubbles, but with the seventh movement, a bubble appears. Now, what do we see when the ocean is in motion? We see a wave. The first six stages of the movement cannot be seen since they are subtle. But despite this, it is from these six states that the six subtle skies are created. This can happen because the skies too belong to the domain of the subtle. But now see the fun of it all. Each sky is a form of energy. The difference between these skies lies in gradation. But the seventh is different in that it creates a bubble here in the hollow. Now these earlier six movements are only forms of energy and a kosh. So in each of you, there is a soul or spirit, atma, to which energy and a kosh are added. Okay, that's the end of that lecture. <laughs> um, do you think you could do another one, Diane? Sure. Diane? Yeah. Crypt Cabin, Thursday, 12th January, 1928. Atma without knowing is Atma. Atman with false knowing is Jeev. Atma with real knowing is Shiv or Sadguru. This false knowing of the Jeev state 
is intellect, buddhi. An ordinary human being then is comprised of the following chief factors, atma, intellect, energy, and akash, which is to say atma, intellect, the subtle body, and the gross body. The wave as represented in figure 39 on the next page has seven divisions. Wave means ocean and ocean means God, but the movement is not God. This movement too has seven divisions and it is due to this movement that there arise the seven divisions in the wave. The oval shape in the upper left of figure 39 represents the ocean, Daria. Immediately below that, the first division stands nearest to the ocean. The second is a little further removed, the third further still, the fourth farthest, and so on. In the hollow, Bokal, at the bottom, the bubble is formed. Take a wave as in the figure, as in the figure. Energy implies movement, and movement proceeds in seven stages. At the same time, movement is subtle and cannot be seen, so the energy too is subtle. Now what are these movements? The points representing them in the figure, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, are stages in the wave itself. Maybe we could take a moment to look at the, the figure drawn here. Um, the original manuscript has a space left intended for a figure, uh, but none was filled in. So. Uh, Nod and I spent a long time on this, trying to uh, bring into the figure the information he's given. So here's the top is Darya or ocean, right? You see in the top left. And down at the bottom, you get to the gross sphere and thus bubbles start to appear. And Baba is talking about the descent of Pran through seven stages. So this is a downward movement from the ocean to the gross sphere, first, second, third stage, fourth stage, fifth stage, sixth stage, seventh stage. And these correspond to the seven skies. He actually talks about the skies here. So the first stage is the seventh sky, Arshe Muala, if you remember that term in an earlier figure. Sixth sky, the Alame Janani, the fifth sky, the Alame Asar, et cetera. These uh, Persian Arabic terms here. And uh, he's going to describe what happens to Pran at each stage of the descent. And that's being depicted in what Nadia drew in. Like on the fourth stage, on the fourth plane, it breaks into seven subdivisions. And there you can see that happening with the wave there. And on the top, uh, we showed what he described earlier. A wave has three stages of rising, three stages of falling, and a momentary stage of uh, where it doesn't change. And this is the intensity of power, as Bob is going to be explaining. I've gone over this kind of quickly, but uh, this uh, is meant, again, to be a roadmap for what he's going to go through now. Uh, over these next couple lectures. Okay, back to the previous page here. Actually, you know, we should probably do at this juncture is read the key since we just looked at the figure. That's yeah, fine. okay. Yeah, okay. Okay, you want to read the figure? Uh, sorry, I muted you. Oh, let's get Marianne to do this. You ready, Marianne? Marion, me. Marion, sorry. <laughs> Key to figure 39. This figure visualizes the great wave of prawn as it descends from its original oceanic Darya state 
down through the seven skies in seven stages until it arrives at the boundary of the gross sphere at the lower fringes of the first sky. There, energy interacts with hollowness. Drops from the ocean acquire bubbles. And the created universe, as we know it, comes into full expression. The illustration in the top center shows the form of the wave itself with three stages of rising, a crest and three stages of falling. This three same- states. Three states of falling. Oh, and three states mm -hmm. of falling. You wanna read that sentence again, just to be clear. The, the yeah. illustration in the top center shows the form of the wave itself with three stages of rising, a crest, and three states of falling. This same wave form manifests again through the course of prawns descent through seven stages. In the first two stages, the seventh and sixth skies, energy is powerful but quiescent with its force unexpressed. In the third stage or fifth sky, Pran starts to vibrate. In the fourth stage and fourth sky, the wave crests and energy breaks into seven subdivisions. In the fifth stage, Pran tumbles over a waterfall whose three phases correspond to the three subsections of the third sky described in an earlier lecture. In the sixth and seventh stages of the second and first skies, drops clearly differentiate as the stream flows toward the hollow. But the truly momentous event transpires at the seventh stage or first sky, where the subtle sphere meets the gross and prawn and akash clash. For when the stream of energy converges with space or pokal, its drops explode into bubbles. As Baba described this event earlier, the first embodied soul makes its appearance as the electron. The evolution of consciousness proceeds from this point. All three source manuscripts have reserved large spaces for a diagram and in-text references indicate that the subject would have been the wave, its seven subdivisions and the hollow. Unfortunately, no source diagram has yet been found. Figure 39 has accordingly been conceived and created by the artist editor team based on its understanding of this lecture and the next two. Okay. Okay. Or do you want to show that that figure just once more to just let people take yeah. it a little bit? I, I forgot to send that one out. I will send it out this afternoon. So that's Daria or the ocean. And all of this is the descent of Pran, which is totally news to me. I never knew that Pran descended uh, from the seventh plane down to the gross plane. And this is, okay, on the uh, fifth plane, you energy, okay, here you have most powerful energy. It's most powerful on the seventh plane, but it's unexpressed because there is no creation in which to express itself. In the sixth plane, one single field of calm energy, vast and undivided. That's in the sixth sky, which is the sixth sky and sixth plane are very close to each other, hardly to be differentiated. On the third stage or the fifth sky, the alam e asrar, that's the, uh, the world of secrets, energy begins to vibrate. Okay, the fourth stage, uh, energy swells 
to its highest level of force. Now force is expressed or manifested and the vibration breaks into seven divisions, cities. That means occult powers. This is the alame mafuz. Um, the third, the, the fifth stage or the third sky, the alame kud, um, the uh, wave now passes over a waterfall in three sections. First, right at the crest of the waterfall, then the storm as it free falls, and then at the bottom where it breaks into bubbles. And you may recall that uh, the third uh, sky has three subdivisions. He gave different names to them and described within them. Okay, at the second sky, uh, you get the emergence of drops finally, clear emergence of drops. And in the first sky uh, where Pran clashes with the Kosh, you have the emergence of bubbles. You didn't have bubbles before this. It has to encounter hollowness or emptiness or a kash or pokol before uh, uh, drops uh, can become bubbles. So that's what this diagram illustrates. Again, it's just based on what Baba talked about in the lectures. Mm -hmm. Let's see, where were we? I think we were back here still. Okay, the last paragraph. Beginning the seven movements? Yes. Yeah, yeah. The seven movements we have been discussing are the seven skies or asmans. They are the subtle forms of the movements, which is to say of the energy. No gross forms, no gross form appears in the first six stages of the movements or prawn. But the last stage arrives at the gross and here the bubble arises, although energy persists into this stage like the earlier ones. This portion of the wave, that is the last and seventh stage, still has drops, but now each drop has acquired a bubble. Why? because movement energy still suffuses. Each drop remains in reality, nothing but the ocean. And each drop with its bubble is comprised of energy. The energy drop naturally has prawn and the bubble implies akash. Now the six prior movements like the seventh carry drops with them and these drops too have energy, but they lack bubbles. For this reason, drops of the first six movements take the form of spirits, such as devas and angels. Those the, though these spirits experience different states. Why? because they appear at different stages in the wave movement process. So it is only natural for their states to differ. But throughout these first six stages, all drops belong to the domain of the subtle. But in the seventh stage, with the appearance of the bubble, drops have arrived at the gross. These earlier drops of the first six stages have knowing, but what they know is the subtle. Among these, only one class, those occupying the first tier, marked as first stage in figure 39, has knowing of the ocean because it is nearest. Indeed, we might say that it touches and is almost one with the ocean. All of this grand processional of movements and stages transpires so that the drop may come to know itself. This final truth, I am the ocean, establishes that all this show and manifestation of the created universe is really just nothing 
nothing at all. For when at last this real knowing dawns, all this which was previously undergone has no further use. But without this medium, Sadan, of the earlier false knowing, the whole story is a no-go. Booty or intellect is false to be sure. But without booty, the real knowledge of realization cannot be achieved. When this intellect gains shuddhi, purity, then real awakening arrives when it is touched by love. Then it discovers the way by which it can come to know its self. Remember, movement, pran, and the hollow, hokal, are not themselves the ocean, but they are in the ocean. So keep this in mind. And I repeat, the ocean is in the state of movement and hollow. And the movement and the hollow are in the ocean. But the movement and the hollow are not the ocean. The movement creates a bubble in the hollow. The moving wave is called Ishwar. This movement is a single wave. Maybe you could read the note. It's quite a significant statement there. In the footnote. All right. Yeah. In infinite intelligence, Baba used the word Ishwar to designate God as creator, preserver, and destroyer. In an extraordinary section of series 10 of that book, see especially pages 207 to 217, Baba reviews in detail the very intimate and highly personalized role which Ishwar plays in the daily sleep dream wakefulness cycle of every individual including not only humans, but even stones. If that discussion and this present lecture are both using Ishwar to designate the same aspect of God, then perhaps Baba is indicating that Ishwar has not only a universal, but an individual aspect. In the latter capacity, coming into manifestation, and disappearing in accordance with the greater life story of every jivatma. In Advaita Vedanta, Ishwar is used to designate Sagun, Sagun, Brahman. Sagun Brahman. Yeah. Sagun Brahman, or the personal aspect of God. That Vedantic usage may help to illuminate Baba's discussion here. Okay. Take one of these waves and drops at the end of the seventh stage, and here at last we find the jeeves. As long as there is a jeev, that jeev has Ishwar or God. When in the end, jeev becomes shiv. The Jeev, Ishwar, and the bubble all vanish. Okay. It's actually kind of an amazing paragraph if you think through its implications. Okay, we're down to the last two. What do you think? Should we do one more? Or? I think we should try to do both of them. Aren't they short? They're fairly short. I yeah. think in, if, if people are willing... Um, I think we can get through those next two. And, um, it would be worth it because they're all interrelated also. I think so all too. The, they're all yeah. of a piece, yeah. Elizabeth, do you want to pick up for us, please? Sure. The wave before the arising of the movement is one with the still ocean or daria. 
what causes the Daria to form waves? Answer, these seven movements that we were speaking of yesterday, these seven movements we were speaking of yesterday. Now, though this bubble as the emptiness of vacuum at the bottom of figure 39 represents the seventh stage of the movement, at the same time, it corresponds to the first sky or Asman. But back at the beginning of the process, in the first stage of the descent, we find the seventh sky. Why is this the first stage? Because energy in the beginning, in the first stage, is most powerful. Farther down in the fourth sky, it swells to its crescendo, its highest point. And for this reason, energy manifests here as powers, cities. As it continues to descend, its force manifested as powers lessens. See down near the bottom, the first sky Asman is near, immediately adjacent to the gross world. That is to say the bubble or the hollow and the seventh sky now is distant to the farthest extent. In that seventh sky, again, though power is at its maximum, its energy is of no use because the one who has realized the seventh sky has gained real knowing. You will mark, moreover, that at this stage, he is one with the ocean. So really speaking, the seventh sky stands as a term and designation only. No use or application can be associated with it. For the man stationed there, the seventh Asman is essentially like the seventh Patal or hell. Yeah, this is a real puzzle, this word. <laughs> in Hindu cosmology, particularly as set forth in the Puranas, the, seventh, the seven Patals are the underworlds of which the seventh, the abode of the Nagas, is the lowest and most infernal. Their counterparts are the seven heavens or Savars. Mayor Baba never affirmed such a cosmology, for although he has described the seven skies or asmas at length in this very series of lectures, it is hard to conceive, conceive how seven hells could occupy a comparable nether position. Perhaps in this sentence, Baba was simply referring to a popular concept as a way of saying that at the seventh level, such opposites disappear. Okay. Hafez refers to this state in one of his guzzles. And what this means is that <laughs> The manuscript is blank and we haven't been able to figure out which couplet it was. <laughs> <laughs> Beginning the movement downward from the seventh Asman, here is the sixth Asman. Here in the sixth Asman, energy exists in its pure undivided state. Itself a form of energy, this Asman could be characterized as one single field of energy, vast and undivided. But this energy has no use. For the one who has attained the station in the sixth Asman actually sees God directly. In such a predicament, what purpose would energy serve? We could say that Atma here in the sixth Asman has semi-real knowing. 
Descending further in figure 39 to the fifth Asman, we find energy beginning to vibrate. Though the sixth Asman, through the sixth Asman, energy remained calm. But the soul in the fifth Asman now knows himself, that is, he knows God, and accordingly, he knows that this energy is not God, and so it cannot help him. But, and this but is a great one indeed, when the movement progresses further to the fourth Asman, energy swells to its highest level of force and the vibration that began in the fifth Asman breaks into seven divisions. These divisions comprise the seven cities. Now mark the fourth Asman is perched on the top, on the crest of the wave, on the pinnacle. If one falls from this point, all the turbulence reverts to Darian Shant, the still ocean. One who stands here on the summit of the fourth Asman does not see back below himself where the wave drops off precipitously. Now, as to the falling of the energy at this juncture, have you ever seen the falling of water in waterfalls? In the same manner, from the top point and crest in the wave that we are speaking of, that is the fourth Asman, energy pours down in drops. The hey, word- hey. Hmm. Go ahead. The word waterfall does not appear in this lecture though it does in the next. The phrase, the phrase Baba uses is falls of water. It is possible that some of the Meher Ashram boys brought up on the Deccan Plateau or coastal Maharashtra or in Iran had never seen a waterfall. So when Baba asks this question, it is probably more than just rhetorical. Where he says, have you ever seen the uh, falling of water in waterfalls? Ah. Okay. And so, and as we descend further, that is, from the third Asman downward, now spirits begin to appear. Okay. In the lecture of 12th January, 1928, page 298, Baba gave the phrase divas and angels as a gloss for spirits. He gave some further information about the angelic spirits of the third Asman in his lecture of 31st December, 1927, pages 260 through 62. Here reference was made to the fact that electricity is the 78th shadow of the powers of the yogi in the fourth Asman. Sri now narrated the story of a fourth plane yogi, a Muhammadan, who used his powers for the gaining of self-realization. Eventually he achieved this without the help of a sadguru, though indirectly he actually received such aid. This is the only such case known to Sri in this cycle. Baba must be referring to the achievement of God realization without the grace of a perfect one. Many times Baba indicated that such grace is required. Baba cannot be realized without it. Apparently, this case of the fourth plane yogi is an exceedingly rare exception to the rule. Okay, so now we come to the very last lecture. Cassandra, you're, yeah, you're muted. 
Okay, sorry about that. Uh, Melissa, can I ask you to take us home? Crypt Cabin, <clears throat> Saturday, 14th of January, 1928. Resuming from the point where we stopped yesterday, we find here in the third Osman, energy falling as in waterfalls. This energy passes through three stages as it cascades downwards. Let's Shall see if the note. note. Yeah. I, okay, yeah. Much, much of what follows in this lecture has been obscurely and ambiguously recorded in the source manuscripts. It seems likely, nonetheless, that the three stages of the third Asman, as described here, correspond to the three parts of that Asman as reviewed in the lecture of 31st December, 1927. See pages 260 to 62. See the next footnote for more on what appears to be the governing metaphor in this passage. First, in the beginning, its movement is steady. Second, in mid-cataract, it explodes into a storm. And third, at the bottom, it dissolves into drops. Now, during its flow down the declivity, energy traces a slight curve. By means of this curvature, the wayfarer in the third Asman finds himself able to know the minds of all. Until this point, that is, as far as the curve, Energy has not yet acquired a body. Mind and Atma have pervaded everywhere in all parts of the wave. The mind is not present in the movement that derives from the wave. But as far as the third Asman, the energy remains bodiless. As it descends further to the second Asman, energy acquires a subtle form because now it has changed its direction due to the curve. Energy has been subtle throughout, but the subtle form associates with it only in the second Asman. The Atma at this juncture cannot use energy except through the medium of the subtle body. In the earlier stages of the wave, down as far as the third Asman, the Atma availed itself of the use of energy directly through the mind. But here in the second Asman, it can do so through the subtle body only. Now it is true that in the third, in the third Asman too, the subtle form of energy exists. Drops are comprised of energy, and these drops assume subtle form. Beyond this, in the second stage of the fall in the third Asman, as described above, energy does acquire a subtle body, but it did not do so earlier in the curve. Down the flow of the wave, as far as the curve, no subtle form appears. We should probably read these notes. Yeah. Yes. Though the source manuscripts that have recorded Baba's explanations are hard to make sense of here, it seems that he was explaining the relationship 
between the flow of energy and the subtle body through the metaphor of a waterfall. The fourth asman, apparently, is represented by the summit or ledge at the head of the waterfall, while the third asman corresponds to the flow of the water over the ledge, the waters tumbling through the air and its crashing at the bottom. The curve Baba refers to is probably designates the stream as it begins to pour over the ledge between the fourth asman and the first section of the third asman. Drops begin to emerge and assume subtle form in the second stage of the fall. In the second stage of the fall described under two at the start of the lecture. But it is only in the second asman as the stream continues on below the base of the waterfall that the atma identifies with the subtle form fully. This interpretation is admittedly speculative, but since the original passage poses such difficulties, it is ventured here. Here, nonetheless, as a possible reader's aid. These drops we have been referring to are celestial spirits. <laughs> we better read this too. <laughs> In his lecture of 31st December 1927, Baba spoke of angels or celestial spirits as the denizens of Farishta Devlok in the second part of the third Asman. See page 262 above. In the present passage, however, it seems equally possible that Baba is referring to celestial spirits in the second Asman, something he did not advert to in his review of that station on 30th of December, 1927, pages 256 to 259. Unfortunately, the paragraph that follows this sentence does not disambiguate. So we cannot be completely sure whether he is discussing the second or the third Asman. Energy means live drops. At this stage in the descent, the drops have subtle form. These drops exist perennially. They do not pass through evolution. Only at the moment of Mahapralaya, when complete involution occurs, do all these drops disappear and merge into the ocean. In the 1920s, Meher Baba used the word involution to mean a reversion to the latency of what infinite intelligence calls the fine state, as happens to consciousness and its associated sanskaras in sound sleep. In God Speaks, involution came to mean the conscious ascent through the planes of consciousness in the realization of God but that meaning does not seem relevant to the current passage. Okay, we were then, here, yeah. Then the chance of liberation arises since the subtle form is available. And so at once the Atma seizes it. Indeed, there are so many subtle forms and subtle drops for the ocean contains innumerable drops and each drop takes a new form. So it is only at this time, the moment of Maha Pralaya, that the opportunity opens up. Pran is available, which implies jiv, 
and the subtle body. But the fun of it all is that these lack Atma. <laughs> Baba seems to be saying that all these subtle forms lack souls, Atmas, but that at the moment of Mahapralaya, Atma has the opportunity to identify with these energy drops and gain release. Muktu, Mukti. If the passage really does mean this, and the original text is vexed with difficulties, then Baba is giving information that he never gave elsewhere. Thus, Atma, through the medium of mind, appropriates energy. Atma, mind, and subtle and gross bodies you all have, but the game playing itself out with respect to all of you is that mind, through the subtle and gross bodies, works and accomplishes everything. Atma sees it all, but does not participate in any action. This very Vedantic conception of the Atma as a witness and non-actant is clearly expressed by Meher Baba in his discourse, Maya, part three, transcending the falsehoods of Maya in Discourses, seventh edition, pages 382 to 83. Are we at when? Yes. When, yeah. <laughs> when at last Atma realizes self, then the mind, which has until then acted as the user of the paraphernalia of the gross and subtle, disappears. And consequently, all these adjuncts of the subtle and gross disappear along with it. However, when this same Atma comes back down again after the realization of self, it uses its unlimited knowledge, power, bliss, and power in lieu of the mind which has vanished from the scene. Okay, that's the end. Wow. Jay Baba. <laughs> Jay Baba. Jay Baba. So uh, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to unmute, unmute everybody, but we're going to say first the beloved's prayer, and then I will stop the recording, and then we'll have Q and A. You ready for this? Right. All right. Uh, let me die. unmute. Go ahead and unmute. Beloved God. God. Beloved God. Help us all to love, to love you more and more. And more and more. And still yet more. more. Till we become worthy of union with you. And help and us all to hold the past of others until the very end. Avatar, our Mayor Baba, our